the Apostle Paul, apart from Jesus, is the key figure really in the history of Christianity. But through the ages, Paul has been a controversial figure. Even today, uh, occasionally in our news, uh, we see a conversation about who Paul is and the validity of his voice to represent Christianity. Uh, there's an article in the Sydney Morning Herald just within the last couple of years uh, I've kept. And the title is, should come up on the screen, uh, the title is, Let Falau Follow St Paul's Teaching on Gays and Let Us Find Them Ridiculous. And in the article, uh, I'll quote some of the article. It says, St Paul happens to be the principal architect of the Christian belief system, notwithstanding Jesus, the good guy himself. It goes on to say, the Bible, in all its muddled, wonderful, and sometimes cruel teaching, is relied upon to challenge today's freedoms. And these days, we take Paul's epistles containing many vicious attacks with a pinch of salt, extracting from it the wonderful message of love, and park the other bits. See, Paul is muddled, wonderful, cruel to be taken with a grain of salt. And he's often put head to head in these discussions with Jesus. This author, uh, a member of state parliament, claims that Paul is angry and harsh. His teachings drown out the voice of Jesus in Christianity. And Jesus brings the love and inclusiveness. So Paul, even today, is still very often under attack. I met with someone from our church not too long ago having a coffee and they said to me that we really should disregard Paul's teachings and focus only on the words of Jesus because Paul drifted away from the truth, they said. Now this kind of questioning is not new. Uh, this kind of questioning is the circumstances of the letter to the Galatians around 50 AD. Paul faced very similar challenges to these today. People didn't like his teaching, and so they didn't like Paul. They challenged him. They tried to discredit him. They wanted to stop him. So they questioned his background, his qualification. Was he really an apostle? They questioned his teaching. Is what he is saying consistent with the other apostles and Jesus? And they questioned his life. Was he practicing what he preached? And that was brought into question. And so in Galatians, it's really a very crucial time in church history we're reading about. Because the, the future of Christianity and the mission to the world, which Paul was the key character in, is being brought into challenge. Jewish Christians are seeking to take down his mission. He is the chosen missionary from God to the world. But his gospel as he preached it and the Jews were watching and the practice that was coming from his teaching was losing its Jewish flavour. And so they wanted him stopped. And if they stopped him, they would stop the gospel to the world. In chapter 2, verse 2, in today's passage, Paul admits that he's afraid. He's not usually afraid from what we see of him. He's afraid that he might have been running in vain. He's desperate to preserve the truth of the gospel. And so he feels he needs to defend himself in this letter, Galatians. Not because he wants to protect himself, really, but he knows that the message of the gospel is attached to him. He had to defend himself to preserve the gospel. His mission to the world is under threat. And still today, people take shots at Paul to try and take down Christianity as we see in Sydney Morning Herald. So his defense is important for us as well. And in today's passage, we've broken it into three parts. And there's three separate historical stories that uh, 
Paul recalls. And so we're breaking into three mini sermons today. Three for the price of one. And don't worry, a third of the length each one is. So we're going to have three Bible readings um, to recall these three parts to the story. In the first defense, his authority as an apostle. Was he a true apostle? He'd come late. The other 12 were before him. They'd spent time with Jesus on earth. They'd walked with Jesus and talked and seen his miracles. Paul had none of that. Was Paul a true apostle? So let's read Margaret, the first part, Galatians 1, 10 to 24. Please follow along, Galatians 1, 10 to 24. seeing a light, meeting Ananias, 
getting baptized, but Paul doesn't emphasize any of those events in this account. No, verse 15, it's God. Verse 15, an amazing verse of God's work in conversion and uh, his work for all of us who have trusted Jesus. God, verse 15, God set apart Paul before he was born according to his eternal plan. It wasn't simply a human decision that day. In eternity past, God chose Paul. And God called him by his grace. That's what we talked about last week, the gift of God, his generosity. When you see the gift that God has given his son to save us, it's too good to refuse. That's the call of God. And finally, in verse 15, God was pleased to reveal his son in Paul. See, he doesn't just say Jesus was revealed to Paul, which we would expect if he appeared before his eyes. Galatians, Paul says, the son was revealed in me. That's internal revelation to Paul, close to his heart, changing his heart. Jesus was revealed in Paul. See, Paul's conversion is an act of God. It was humanly impossible for man to convert Paul. And it was humanly impossible for Paul to resist God converting him. What a turnaround. And in the rest of the account, uh, in this first section of today's passage, Paul emphasises he was independent, not reliant on any man for his teaching. He keeps saying that he didn't see the apostles. He didn't go to them. He says, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I didn't go to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. So the revelation that Paul saw from Jesus and heard wasn't now go down to the other apostles and find out what it means to be an apostle. He didn't consult any human, he says. If you wanted to choose yourself to become an apostle today, you'd be looking for the chief of the apostles. You'd be going to Jerusalem. Paul would be booking an appointment with Peter to join the crew. But it was three whole years, Paul says, before he saw any of them. And it was only then that he saw Peter, and he emphasises only for 15 days, three years out yonder, 15 days with Peter and Cephas in Jerusalem. And verse 23 says he was personally unknown to any of the churches back in Jerusalem in that region where the other apostles were. And they praised God in those churches. They heard the story of Paul. They hadn't seen him. They heard the story and they praised God because it was God's work. They understood only God could change Paul. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Was Paul an authorised apostle? Yes. His conversion and commissioning are from God, not from man. Second episode, chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. Paul defends his teaching. So he's defended that he's a true apostle. In 2, 1 to 10, he defends his teaching. Yes, Paul was sent by God, but did his teaching remain pure and true throughout his career as an apostle? As time went on, it seemed to many that Paul's teaching was changing or that the gospel he's, he was preaching was producing a different kind of life amongst the believers. See, he was getting further and further away from Ground Zero, the headquarters in Jerusalem. And the further he went, the less and less Jews were in the churches that he was founding. More and more Gentiles, the nations, were responding to the Jesus movement and joining. And as this happened, it became more and more apparent that the teaching of Paul in churches to the ones closer to Jerusalem. So very physical and practical differences were being noticed. 
the Jewish laws were being neglected in the Gentile churches. Things like circumcision and religious festivals and food laws. So the proud identity, the Jewish identity of the people of God was being diluted by Paul's teaching. Was Paul's teaching pure? That's the second question and the next episode will give us the answer. So Margaret, keep you on your toes. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. preaching. 14 years later, he gets a revelation from God, a message from upstairs. Go back to Jerusalem. Check in with head office. Paul wants to be sure, he says, he's not running his race in vain. And he goes and meets with the pillars of the faith, Cephas, that is Peter, James and John. Some people were calling Paul's gospel into question. Now it looks like Paul starting to doubt his own message. But no, Paul is not doubting his own message here. He's doubting the gospel coming out of Jerusalem. See verse 4. Verse 4. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. See, there was this false teaching following around after Paul in the Gentile world, teaching Gentile converts that they had to start following the Jewish law in order to be part of the group. Jewish Christians going around to Gentile believers telling them you have to be circumcised to be Christian. And Paul knew this isn't the gospel of grace. We saw it last week. The true and only gospel of grace is the gift, gift of Jesus. There is nothing we need to do other than accept it. We can't contribute to it. We can't add works to our salvation. To think that we could improve or top this gift is ridiculous and offensive. God's Son perfectly kept the law for us and died in our place because we all fail to keep the law ourselves. So if you want to go back to keeping the law to save yourself, you're bringing yourself back under judgment. 
because we've all failed under the law. So Paul was going to Jerusalem not to check his own gospel, he was quite sure about this, but to check their gospel, that it wasn't overriding his gospel to the nations. And so Paul took Titus with him, very important. Titus came with Paul, uncircumcised, Greek, Gentile Titus. And Paul, I think, brings him as a guinea pig. Titus will be the test case. Gentile Titus in Jerusalem. See, would Peter and James and John want Titus to be circumcised when he came? Would they insist that Titus needed to be circumcised to be part of the Christian group? Poor old Titus. His foreskin became the focus of one of the great controversies in church history. Soon enough, Titus arrived in Jerusalem. The agitators, the Jewish teachers appeared. There was pressure to circumcise Titus, Paul says. But he says, we did not give in to them for a minute so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Of course, Paul knew that circumcision is neither here nor there. Circumcised or uncircumcised can be equally saved by Jesus. But when you insist on doing something like circumcision to be saved, you're adding works to the gift and perverting the gospel of grace. So Paul had to resist on this occasion. And the Jerusalem apostles, the pillars as he calls them, they agreed with Paul's teaching. They endorsed what Paul said. They were on his side. They were together, consistent in this gospel. Verse 6, he says, They added nothing to my message. Verse 3, not even Titus was compelled to be circumcised. Verse six, verse 9, James, Cephas and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognised the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles. See, Paul's gospel of grace was in alignment with the apostles in Jerusalem, the same free gospel of Christ for the Jews. So, second episode, Paul shows his teaching was pure and consistent with the gospel and in agreement with the gospel of the apostles in Jerusalem. So finally, in our shortest episode, episode three, and perhaps the greatest test for Paul as any leader was his life, the test of the actions of his life. Did his life align with the message he was preaching? True belief leads to true action. If you believe something to be true, you act upon it. Otherwise, your actions show, reveal that you don't actually believe it. If you believe the weather forecast that it's going to rain today, you might not hang the washing out. But if you hang the washing out anyway, you show that you didn't believe the weather forecast. For Christian leaders, this is so important. The life of the leader becomes the example of his teaching. So leaders are to watch their life and doctrine closely because how they live represents the gospel they teach. And it's a powerful testimony to the truth when you see a life that aligns with the truth of the gospel. Very sadly, there's many stories of leaders who have sinned terribly and covered over sin and their message has lost all credibility and people lose faith in God. It's very hard to trust a leader when you discover something like this undercover. Can what he says really be true? Jesus' harshest and most angry criticism was for Leaders who said one thing and did another, the Pharisees, who led so many others astray. What about Paul's life? Did his life match his teaching? Well, our last episode, verses 11 to 14, give us a story of a time when the Apostle Peter 
split that and what would Paul do on that occasion? Our last reading, Galatians 2, 11 to 14. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his, in his hypocrisy, so that, they, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Well, we know from the second episode, the Titus test case, <laughs> that Peter and Paul both agreed that keeping the law should not be added to the gospel. It isn't required for salvation. And so when Peter ventures up north to Gentile country, where these new churches are being planted, he's visiting Antioch, which is like the uh, home church of the Gentile mission that went further abroad. Paul, uh, Peter is eating with the Gentiles, and he's eating non-kosher foods that the Jewish law banned ham sandwiches, shellfish, bacon and eggs. But when they, certain Jewish men, arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. See, Peter suddenly stops eating with the Gentiles, effectively excluding them from his fellowship. Well, immediately Paul can see that Peter is not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. The free gospel says all are included by Christ's blood. Apart from works of the law, in terms of salvation, it doesn't matter what we eat. So God's people should all eat together. We know that Peter knew this was true. But because of his fear of men, these Jewish teachers who came from Jerusalem, his actions started to teach something different to the truth. Peter's actions gave the impression that you had to follow the food laws to be included with God's people. His actions were teaching something different to his words. His actions were compelling Jews and Gentiles to eat according to the Jewish food laws in order to stay a part of the Christian church. And Paul names it what it is. Hypocrisy. Verse 13. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy. So that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. We see that others are led astray by following Peter's actions that didn't match the truth of the gospel. You can imagine this was a very challenging moment for Paul too. What would he do? Would his actions align with his teaching? Did Paul really believe that the gospel is everything? That the true gospel is the difference between heaven and hell? That trying to work to earn your salvation puts you under God's curse? If he believed this, he really had to say something. If Paul didn't step up and say something, his actions would have taught that he didn't really believe the true gospel was all that important. And just remember who this is that Paul is facing. It's Peter. Peter is the one that Paul had to stand up to. The great pillar of the church. The head honcho. The Peter to whom Jesus said, On this rock I will build my church. Confronting Peter publicly would be awkward. It would be damaging. It would not be positive press. The newspapers would love the controversy. And surely people would twist the story and divide over it. 
But Paul believed what he taught, and so he acted. Verse 11. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. And verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Paul spoke up. He opposed Peter publicly to his face. He spoke to preserve the truth of the gospel. Paul's life matched his teaching. He exemplified his teaching. His life, along with his words, proclaimed the gospel. Paul's life was authentic. So three episodes we have. The Apostle Paul defends his story, defends himself. He was a true apostle of God. His teaching was the true gospel of God in line with the apostles. And his life and actions were authentic. He lived out what the people could see he believed. And Paul is our apostle. He's the apostle to the nations, to the world. His message continued on as he preached the gospel even with great opposition. And so uh, we're thankful for Paul and his uh, mission. And we continue to listen to him and grow as we hear his teaching even today. So let's thank God. Let's pray and thank God for Paul and the mission of Jesus. Our Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that by his free gift of his life, we are saved. We know there's nothing we can bring. We need to bring nothing to you. We are saved by your grace. And thank you for Paul. Thank you for the great turnaround. Your call to him. Your grace at work in him that transformed him from enemy to friend. That uh, no man could do that. And we thank you for the apostle and the strength of his conviction and his belief and his teaching. We thank you that his uh, letters have been preserved for us and we can learn from him and be inspired by him. So Father, please help us to keep listening to your words uh, through Paul. Please help us to keep trusting this wonderful gospel of grace. And we thank you for these wonderful stories that we have, that we can see the life and times of the early church. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.